Over the past four years working specifically in lab testing, VO2 max, blood lactate analysis of endurance athletes, so you cyclists, runners, rowers, triathletes, kayakers, mountaineers, the whole works. I've learned a lot about some key things that, that have come from physiology in terms of what do we see commonly across a lot of endurance athletes? What are similarities? What are some of the differences? And then also what are some of the key takeaways in terms of why testing is important? So I thought I'd accumulate all of that knowledge after doing over 1500 VO2 max tests for athletes over the last little while into a short video summarizing those five key points that I've sort of taken away. So without any further ado, let's get into it. Hey, welcome back to the channel. Nick here talking science of endurance and everything sports science in general. Thanks to everyone who subscribed to the channel and supporting the channel. But if you haven't, consider hitting that big red button down below. Subscribe to the channel, keep up to date with all the latest videos, get involved with our live streams Wednesday night, 7 p.m. Melbourne time, get involved with our Q&A so you can get your questions answered, join in on the discussion as well. And if you've got a specific question or want to get in direct in touch with me, head over to Instagram at NJ underscore sports science. I'll put it down the bottom corner here. Jump over there. It's the easiest way to get directly in touch if you do have a very specific question, if you want any additional advice, anything like that, or if you're not able to join us on the live stream or you want to just sort of share it in a bit more of a private forum, Head over to Instagram, send me a direct message, happy to help you out there, and maybe some of the content will turn into a video as well. Um, or if you do have any topic ideas, let me know in the comments down below or over on Instagram if you want a particular video made on a particular topic in sports science you'd be interested in. In terms of today's video, like I said in the intro, it's a bit of a summary of four years worth of work. Over 1,500 VO2 max tests I've watched athletes go through, analyze their data for, and not all of that is 1,500 athletes. It's athletes coming in two, three, four, five, 10 times over the last couple of years to be able to do their testing and keep up to date. But it's across a whole range of athletes, amateur right through to elite, cyclists, runners, triathletes, ultra marathon runners, um, kayakers, rowers, a whole bunch of different uh, endurance athletes overall. And so what I thought I'd do is break down the five key things I've taken away from looking at all of that data, looking at all of that physiology. What are some of the things that I see commonly and what are some of the things I think are really important to note? So first thing I want to talk about is I'd argue 85% to 90% of the amateur athletes I test, which is the bulk of the people that I test at the amateur level who are keen endurance athletes. They do it maybe for a bit of fun. They, they like to race and compete, maybe want to go to an age group world championships. I'm bulking everyone in that perspective. Anyone who's not racing as a job, basically, and who's not an elite or a professional, 85 to 90% show very, very similar trends in their data. And what do I mean by that? It's because the traditional endurance athlete mindset is... I'm going to go and do lots of race-specific training. I'm going to do lots of long and slow. So what does that mean? The majority of athletes that come in all have very, very similar qualities in terms of aerobic capacity and their ability to use oxygen in long and slow terms or be able to go from A to B, so get from start to finish line, go for a reasonably long period of time. They've all got reasonably good ability at threshold because that is typically where all the race-specific stuff comes from. I mean, the average runner is going out and doing long and slow tempo and threshold intervals in their week and that's kind of it, and they just roll that round year round. What does that then translate to? Is I, well, I come in and I can basically pinpoint where someone's going to be at based on what their 5K time is, what their, um, what their 5K, what their 10K time is, and then maybe some other additional information about how many times they run a week. I get a pretty good idea of exactly what they're going to look like at the end of the test, and without even looking at some of the data sometimes, I can kind of already tell them what, it, what we need to do in terms of the type of training because it's obvious just to analyze, well, what are you missing in your training currently because that's going to be your weakness. And sure enough, what we see is we see some weaknesses in aerobic power. So that's ability to turn, uh, use oxygen really quickly. What is the rate we can use oxygen? And ultimately, that equates to having a pretty okay VO2 max, pretty average, maybe in the 50s, maybe low 60s, but threshold is at like 95% of VO2 max. There are V6 engine running on six cylinders if you want to use a car analogy. It's pretty good, it's usable, but it's nowhere near as good as a V8 engine like what some of the professionals have, much bigger VO2 max, and then they can do more with it. And also they're limited because in terms of their performance, they can't actually get any faster at threshold, they can't get any faster sub, uh, at sub-maximal intensity because the top end's holding them back. VO2 max is, is, is only so high, so without shifting that, you've got only so far to move everything else up because your threshold can't exceed your VO2 max. And I've talked about this on the channel before. So that's a very common thing I see. Most, most of the time, majority of athletes, I'd argue 85 to 90% of the people I test show those same trends in terms of high, high percentage of VO2 max where the threshold sits. Pretty okay VO2 max, but there's plenty we can do at the top, majorly based on the type of training they do because they, hold, they follow that pretty traditional endurance training methodology. Lots of long and slow, fair, maybe a bit of tempo in there, and then also 
lots of threshold because it's reasonably race specific, but they're not necessarily worrying about some of those other critical important qualities like VO2 max to be able to boost up the engine for a V6 to a V8 so they can do more with it later on and be able to move up in terms of a different performance level. Number two is kind of leveraging off that 85 to 90% of athletes and what I typically see is it's all about taking transport and utilize. And I'm going to emphasize that utilize part because it comes majorly down to how well can the body actually use the oxygen. It's all very well to take it in, breathe in lots of air. I see plenty of athletes, big guys, 100 and, 190 odd centimeters, 110 kilos. They can breathe in over 200 liters of air by the end of the test. Happy days. I've seen as high as 266 liters of air per minute at the end of a test. Massive ventilation, huge lung capacity. But their VO2 max is very good because they can't use the oxygen at the working muscle. And what I mean by this, I might actually put a graph up on the screen of what I want to show. This is a cyclist that came in and saw me a couple of years ago now. Um, and I wanted to use some old data because I didn't want to have anything recent in case, because I don't want anyone to be able to initially identify this data. But in terms of what we've got, the orange line is their initial test. We tested them, had a look what their oxygen consumption was. That orange line is a very, very typical graph of how well the body can actually use oxygen. And before I go any further, this metric I'm looking at here is what we call fraction of expired oxygen. So what we're measuring is the percentage of oxygen that the athlete breathes back out. Why am I interested in how much oxygen they're breathing out and not what they're using? Well, because it indicates how much they're using. At sea level, 21% or approximately 21% of the oxygen we breathe in, or sorry, the air we breathe in is oxygen. So if 21% of the air we breathe in is oxygen, and we're breathing back out. In this case, you can see the orange line there sort of hovers around 16% and then start to get a little bit higher. If we're breathing at 16%, what does that mean? 5% of the available oxygen is actually being used by the working muscle. 21 gets breathed in, 16 is being breathed back out. Whatever's missing has to be used internally. So what we then end up with is humans aren't really efficient, super efficient. This number in terms of what we're breathing back out never gets to zero. As much as you might think you're an amazing athlete and you can use lots of oxygen, you will never get this FeO2 number down to zero. Humans just aren't that efficient at using oxygen compared to other things. So what we ideally want to do is get this FeO2 percentage when we're looking at it in a test down. And you can see that blue line, the after test, three months later after going away and doing some training appropriate to what this athlete needed, we brought that down, got them better at using oxygen at the muscle so that when they were breathing in the same amount of air, when they were transporting and pumping out the same amount of blood from the heart, heart rate was the same, we were getting much better aerobic usability or using a lot more oxygen to create our energy rather than relying too much on the anaerobic side of things. It then leads to, you have a look here, the blue line goes out longer, another three and a half minutes past the orange line. Why? The athlete didn't fattigue as early. They were able to push longer into the test to a higher wattage. On the bike, this was higher VO2 max as a result. And if I bring up the VO2 max graph here, oxygen consumption was pretty much identical all the way until where they maxed out in the pre-test or the before test, that orange line the blue line continues and oxygen consumption goes up. In the space of three or so months, three and a half months between tests, we see an athlete go from a VO2 max of 42, 43 to a VO2 max of 49 or 50. Pretty significant change, which then kind of leads me into point number three is that VO2 max can change. And when it changes, it can change really big in the endurance athlete, particularly the amateur or recreational athlete. This is kind of a myth within our industry is that VO2 max can't change. It can you can move it, you can do basically, when I say you can basically do whatever you like with it, you can increase it, you can decrease it, you can keep it the same. As we age, yes, it gets harder. So the athlete who's 60, 55, 60 years of age, we might start to see, okay, maybe there's not too much more we can increase on your VO2 max. You probably already hit where your body's gonna get to. And it's more at that point about minimizing the decline year on year through age rather than increasing above where we are. Younger athletes, 20s, 30s, 40s, 40, even 40 years of age and in that sort of bracket, we can still dramatically increase and particularly for the amateur athlete, we're not doing enough training or the right type of training or being specific enough to actually hit our genetic potential like what the elites are. So I see quite often, a lot of the time, three to four month training period in between tests, VH max will go up 10, 12, 15%. And in this case uh, that I showed you just before, went up quite significantly, 43 to about 49 or so in the space of three months is a pretty significant change. What did that also change? Bigger engine gave him a better, in terms of his percentage where his threshold sat at, moved up relative. We gained about 25, 30 watts at threshold by not even targeting threshold, we targeted our VO2 max. So it was a bit of an indirect adaptation there. They're those bonuses you can gain by having a bigger engine. V8's always gonna be more powerful than the V6. Even if it's running on six out of eight cylinders compared to a V6 on six, bigger engine's always gonna do a lot more and be a lot more useful majorly because we can use more oxygen, more aerobic energy, it's less fatiguing or not fatiguing at all. 
anaerobic energy is going to be our killer. So the better we can use oxygen, the better that FeO2, ideal. But like I said, VO2 max can change. Let's dispel that myth now. I've done enough of these tests. I've done well over 1500 to be able to tell you that VO2 max can change and it will change. And if you do it, do the right things in terms of identifying where you need to train, you can change things really, really dramatically over not, not much period of time, three, four months, pretty easy to do. Moving into another one I see a lot is generic heart, heart rate zones. Going and doing a 220 minus your age and taking a percentage or the MAFTO method where you go 180 minus your age, whatever you're using. Very rarely for an endurance athlete population, I'm not talking about everyone in the population, general pop, where it's we've got people who don't do any activity, we've got elite athletes in there, we've got everyone. I'm just talking about people who engage in endurance endurance activity, whether recreational, go out for a couple of runs a week to their racing age group world championships to maybe borderline elite. For the most part, generic equations do not work. Why? Because we do enough training to see adaptation to be away from the norm. Very rare and it's it doesn't happen a lot. It does happen sometimes by pure fluke that an athlete will come in and we see their heart rate zones based on the information we're getting from a VO2 max test. And Maffetone method told them to run in their long and slow at 130 beats per minute or 140 beats per minute. They come in and sure enough, we're telling them to run 130, 140 beats per minute. That doesn't happen a lot. What happens a lot is athletes come in and go, oh, it, it says I need to be running 130, but I feel like I'm pretty much walking at that point or it's really hard to keep the bike upright because I'm riding so slow. They come in, do the testing. We actually find out their long slow is all the way up to 155 beats per minute. So they should actually be doing 140 to 155. Well, that, that's a pretty significant shift, particularly a lot of athletes who struggle with having a high heart rate compared to the normal. Genetically, that's that's something that they maybe not be able to control too much. Those generic equations are all over the place. And on the other end of the spectrum, athletes have much lower heart rate than the average as well. They might need to go out and ride at 110, 120 beats per minute because they max out at 150. I've seen that happen before. But a mafto method tells them they should be able to ride at 140. So they're just cooking themselves all the time and they're long and slow. All of these things uh, are the individual difference we see in the testing. So generic zones are really no good. I mean, they're a means to an end, but for the most part, they just don't work because they're not accurate to your individual needs. And that's where a lab test can actually identify and tell you that directly. The last thing I'm going to cover here is you never 100% know until you test it. Whether you just do field testing, whether you jump on and do an FTP test on Zwift, you go and do a 2K time trial, a 5K time trial running, whatever it might be. Until you go and do a test and you push yourself maximally, and believe me, I've seen enough of these tests that I know when people get on the treadmill and they do not give it 110% and they push themselves until they feel like they cannot go anymore. I've had plenty of people stop at four millimoles of blood lactate. Four millimoles is where most people hit their threshold. So it's quite frustrating for me when I, I, I can't push them any further because it is a voluntary test. I can't force you to go any faster or any harder on the treadmill than what you feel comfortable doing. But when I get athletes who... I know that they haven't gone as hard as they possibly can. We, it does impact the data. So making sure that you actually test and you test properly, but doing the testing is going to actually tell you what, what you might be missing. Been plenty of times I've, I've had athletes that I've coached, they've done programs for, they've given recommendations to, they come back in they, and they test. We think that everything's going in the right direction, but we find something that we, we weren't actually sure was happening. We find something that we didn't want to happen. Great example of this is I've had plenty of cyclists who I give them a recommendation Let's say we get through a VO2 max test. We see their VO2 max happen at 330 watts, for example. Um, what, what, is, what, is, what do we want to try and do? We want to try and lift that up. If we, if we see that trend at the top end, we want to try and improve their aerobic power. So I might recommend doing two to four minutes on at 95% of max. Should be about, what, 300 to 315 watts there, there or thereabouts. I'm doing some very rough maths here as I talk. But we want to do two to four minutes on equal recovery. They go away, three months, they come back. And then we have a conversation before we do the test about what they were doing. They go, oh, I feel like I'm going really well because in those two to four minute efforts you gave me with equal, very easy spinning recovery, I was able to hit 350 or 360 watts in every two minute effort. And they go, okay, cool. So either we've ad adapted here or you're just really good at repeat sprint. We get into the test and their VO2 max is actually worse than it was previously. And they don't get as far into the test, but they can tolerate a lot more blood lactate. What we've done there is just taught your ability to repeat sprint. So without doing that follow-up test, I don't know if the, ad the adaptation's actually occurred. You might think you're going in the right direction, but what we've actually done there is actually become much better at using the anaerobic processes rather than the aerobic processes we intended. We haven't actually adapted. VO2 max hasn't changed how we want it to. We haven't improved the size of the engine. We just got better at making ourselves hurt for a two-minute block, which in some cases is okay. If you're a track sprinter, if you're a short-distance athlete, team sport athlete, we need to do this at certain points. 
But if you're a marathon runner or a long, long distance road racer, ultra runner, and that's what we're doing, that's missing the mark. So being, being sure of exactly what we need to do and knowing what is happening by testing is a really cr critical part of the, the equation as well. So hopefully you got a little bit out about my five takeaways from 1500 test worth in terms of VO2 max, getting in the lab with athletes and having a look at their physiology. If you have any questions about anything else or any, any other things that you think uh, might be interesting to know about the testing, like I said, I've done enough of these that I know majority of what's happening across all of them. But if you have any questions about the testing process or what we see in our physiology, any specific parts of the process you want to see or hear me talk about more, Leave it in the comments down below. Always happy to hear your thoughts and hear your questions. As always, continue to subscribe to the channel and keep supporting this great community and keep growing this great community we've got here. Head over to Instagram at NJ underscore sports science in the bottom right here. Ask your questions directly. Follow over on Instagram. We're getting close to a thousand followers on Instagram as well. So it'd be great if we could tick that off as well as hitting two and a half thousand subscribers on YouTube by the end of the year. Not far away at all. I've gone a little bit longer than normal today, but I had quite a lot to cover. So hopefully you did get something out of it and enjoyed me discussing that process and, and really reflecting on the last four years of my work uh, in sports science and in the lab. That is it for today. We'll leave it there and we'll see you in the next one.